All right, good afternoon. We'll go ahead and get started in just a minute. I'm gonna wait until we can have everyone join us. I see our attendee list is climbing. Give it just a few more seconds and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. All right, welcome everyone to the Mejlam Center seminar series. I would like to go over some brief housekeeping rules for today's seminar. We will have a Q&A during the last 10 to 15 minutes of the seminar hour. So please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box in your toolbar at the time um, during the seminar. They will be answered um, during that last 10 to 15 minutes. You may also use the raise your hand feature when we move to the Q&A portion of our seminar. And I can change your status from an attendee to webinar panelist so you, can, you will be able to ask your question verbally. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Moorhart to go ahead and introduce Dr. Karlowish. Thank you, Lisa. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I couldn't be more pleased to introduce our speaker for today, um, Dr. Jason Karlowish. Um, I so wish that we could have you here in person today, but so glad to have you uh, remotely. Um, Dr. Karlowish is Professor of Medicine, Medical Ethics, and Health Policy and Neurology at the University of Pennsylvania. He cares for patients at the Penn Memory Center, which he co-directs. His research um, focuses on issues at the intersection of bioethics, aging, and the neurosciences. And as leader of the Penn program, for precision medicine for the brain, he and his colleagues have investigated the development and translation of Alzheimer's treatments and biomarker-based diagnostics. This work includes the A4 study and generation program and studies supported by the NIA. Jason developed the assessment of capacity for everyday decision-making or ACEd a widely disseminated instrument that assesses a person's ability to solve an everyday functional pro problem. Uh, this work led to the development of the Interview for Decisional Abilities, or IDA, in collaboration with colleagues at Cornell to train frontline staff in assessing a client's decisional capacity. His essays on aging, ethics, and Alzheimer's, which I always love to read, have appeared in Forbes, The Hill, The New York Times, The Philadelphia Inquirer, Stat News, and The Washington Post. He is the author of Open Wound, The Tragic Obsession of Dr. William Beaumont, a novel based on true events along the 19th century American frontier, and his most recent publication, the book, The Problem of Alzheimer's, which I have with me, and I encourage everyone to get a copy, um, How Science, Culture, and Politics Turned a Rare Disease into a Crisis and What We Can Do About It. It's an account of how Alzheimer's became a crisis and the steps needed to address it. So I'd like to um, warmly welcome Dr. Jason Karlowish, Northwestern alum, back to Northwestern, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Darby. Yeah, go Cats. I, uh, it's great to be back at Northwestern. I wish I was there live and in person. I have fond memories of my days uh, on campus there at the medical school, or 800 Lake, North Lakeshore Drive, and then also in Evanston, where I did my undergrad. Um, uh, I'll be back. Well, I'll make it out there. Um, this is me. I, I'm at Penn now. I'm at, talking to you from my home in Philadelphia. If you want to learn more about me, that's my website, and I'm one of those folks that do Twitter. There's the Twitter hashtag. And what I'm here to talk to you today about is um, kind of a, a story I've lifted from this large story, this book I, that just came out about a month ago. It was uh, Macmillan. 
Um, and I guess if there's an overall message, um, <clears throat> it's that uh, uh, science and culture turned a rare disease into a common disease, and then politics turned it into a crisis. And if there's an overall message about what we can do about it, is that certainly uh, pharmacotherapeutics, drugs, are going to help, uh, but we're not going to drug our way out of this complicated humanitarian problem. And over the course now of the remaining time, I'll develop all those points. Uh, the book's available in hardback, but also uh, E and audio if you want to listen to it, et cetera. So um, uh, in about 1980, but then republished in a book uh, collection of essays in 1983, the physician and writer Lewis Thomas published uh, this essay called The Problem of Dementia. Uh, uh, Lewis Thomas is a very interesting character. He it was a physician. He was trained in oncology. He was a very prominent uh, researcher in oncology. And he was also a leader in academic medicine, even the dean at Yale, and he would go on to lead uh, the Morris Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute. And he was an essayist, uh, and this is one of his essays collected into that book. Um, must have been quite a guy to hang out with at night, uh, given what he was doing, uh, uh, such as listening to Mahler's Ninth. But setting aside this perhaps somewhat pretentious title, this very provocative essay that this oncologist, researcher, NIH-funded, um, and physician wrote about a disease that was quite new compared to oncology, cancer, uh, on the field. And, and I'll quote you from the very begin, uh, beginning bits of that essay. Um, Thomas called for special consideration and high priority for one particular disease, not a disease of the month, but a disease of the century, he wrote. The brain disease that affects increasing numbers of our population because of its increasing population of older people in our society senility or it is now termed senile dementia the major form of the disorder alzheimer's disease affects more than 500,000 people over the age of 50 most of them in their 70s and 80s it's responsible for most of the beds in the country's nursing homes at a cost exceeding 10 billion now and scheduled to rise to 40 billion or more within the next few years it is he wrote the worst of all diseases not just for what it does to the patient but for its devastating effects on families and friends i have to give dr thomas credit um, some four decades ago to write this very pithy summary, which resonates today. Namely, it's a common disease. It's only getting more common. Um, it's costly. Um, and it's not just costly in terms of money, but it's costly as well for its effect on other people, namely families and friends. I should also note, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, is some things he doesn't say there. He doesn't talk about the caregiver, for example, Example, and I'll bring that up later. But this framing of the problem in 1980 is a fairly contemporary framing. Um, and, and what's notable again is done by a non Alzheimer's person, if you will. Um, <clears throat> and just prior to that essay, this um, neurologist, Robert Katzman, had published a short essay in 1976 in what was then Archives of Neurology, now um, uh, uh, JAMA Neurology. And uh, this short essay, 1,200 words, not a science report, uh, called The Prevalence and Malignancy of Alzheimer's Disease, a Major Killer, made the argument that the thing that is called senility, which was just thought of as an extreme stage of aging, therefore something that medicine had really very little interest in um, for diagnosis and treatment, that actually that wasn't uh, uh, what was causing senility, that we should recast senility as uh, dementia caused by the uh, uh, disease called Alzheimer's disease, which up until that point had been thought of as a, quote, rare disease occurring only in younger individuals. And Katzman would have summarized the scientific case for that and make the case that it was a major killer, prevalent, prevalent and a killer. So my point is, is that by um, uh, the early 80s, uh, along with the founding of the um, self-help group that would come to be known as the Alzheimer's Association, the, if you will, modern Alzheimer's movement got going. And um, so now let me fast forward to 2009. In 2009, the United States Congress commissioned a, uh, a study group, the Alzheimer's study group, uh, modeled after the Iraq study group, to examine uh, the Alzheimer's problem in America. And this is the report that they would issue back to Congress in March of 2009. Uh, and uh, this is the opening paragraph. The Alzheimer's crisis, like the disease itself, will unfold gradually, making it all too easy to ignore until we have a little opportunity to alter its impact. The prospect of an overwhelming hurricane never became real enough to people 
to top the strengthening of New Orleans levees. The result was $82.2 billion in damage and so on. The word crisis would appear some 29 times in this report. And the framing here is of not just a costs to humans in terms of lives and suffering, but financial costs very much also was part of the framing of this. So in some sense, kind of um, Dr. Thomas's essay, if you will, exaggerated. Uh, disease of the century, the Alzheimer's crisis. And so one has to ask oneself, what happened between 1980, when awareness was being raised and recognition had been raised, and 2009, when a group of um, prominent leaders in science and politics and policy convened and requested by Congress comes together and calls it a crisis. What happened? Why did that happen? And that's what I'd like to talk to you about. And so to tell you about that, I'm going to do what some historians do, which is I'm going to take you back to the beginning. And the reason I'm going to take you back to the beginning is I'm going to explain uh, how this man uh, whose name is attached to the disease we all care about, and his colleagues were onto some really spectacular advances, but then some things happened. So this man is a Lois Alzheimer's, and there he is with his wife and children. Lois Alzheimer's was, uh, <clears throat> was German. He uh, 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 came from a middle-class, upper-middle-class Catholic family. He was scientifically minded as a child, chose not to go into the ministry or pharmacy uh, as many of his uh, uh, siblings had, but instead to pursue what would be called what was called psychiatry, um, and that was a nice guy. He um, was a big guy. He's tall. I'll show you some photos that give you a sense of how tall he was. Um, liked his beer for a while. Had a bit of a wild youth, but sort of settled down in, into his medical studies, and would become enamored of the use of microscopy um, to study brain tissue. So he was one of a, a group of mostly German, and that'll be a very important point, uh, psychiatrists who practiced psychiatry and also did pathologic correlation. So after a patient died, they would harvest the brain, slice it up and stain it and examine it. And that he liked doing that work and he was very good at that work. Um, he was a very good uh, stainer as they were called somewhat pejoratively. And, and one of his patients is this woman, August Dieter, um, and in 1906, on a Saturday afternoon, uh, uh, he presented her case. And the reason why he was interested in Auguste Dieter uh, was because she came into his asylum uh, and um, her presentation was a lot like the way many of the senile patients presented. That is to say the older adults who had senility, which of course was caused by aging. And what interested Dr. Alzheimer's was she wasn't old, she was young, comparatively, in her 50s at the time when the disease started when, before, when her husband was, began to notice things. And the other thing that was notable was she didn't have any other causes for insanity, for, for dementia, uh, in particular dementia is the term, namely no evidence of having um, alcoholism, vascular disease, stroke, or syphilis infection. And so what he was left with was, how is it that this young person is presenting like the senile? He would follow her. In fact, after he left the asylum that he was working at, caring for her, and moved to Munich, he would keep in touch with the folks taking care of her. When her husband ran out of money to care for her, how, how very contemporary problem, and wanted to move her to a state asylum, Elias Alzheimer's, having married into wealth, shipped cash down to help keep her at the asylum. He was determined to get her brain, and he did get her brain, and he reported the results of his autopsy study. Namely, he saw these um, uh, uh, tangles and plaques, if you will, in between her neurons and said there's, and, and concluded, we don't know what is causing this, but there's something going on. Now, the, this case report is considered to be, quote, the first patient with Alzheimer's. Of course, there were plenty of patients prior to her who had Alzheimer's disease, but the point is this is the first patient among the first patients for whom a physician was saying there's a disease going on here and I think I'm seeing bits of that disease. Um, I mentioned to you how uh, tall he was. This photo tries to capture his height. He's there on the left. And, and I, I mentioned this already earlier, how he was German and worked with other German physicians. And you see here uh, key players in the group, namely Emil Kreplin, right next to Wes Alzheimer's. And on the far side there on the right, um, uh, Franz Nissel of uh, the Nissel stain, which was one of the most important technological advances at the time, because that stain allowed uh, uh, people like Elias Alzheimer's and Nissel 
to see neurons in the brain. Prior to that, it was very hard to even visualize neuronal, neuronal tissue. It was just sort of a messy mass. And it was that technological advance akin to some of the imaging technologies we have now, which allowed people like Alois Alzheimer's to do his work. Emil Kreplin was a psychiatrist. He was to psychiatry as William Osler was to American medicine or Louis Virchow was to German internal medicine. Namely, he really paved the way for uh, uh, the uh, approach to psychiatry um, uh, that we think of now, that is to say diagnostic categories. He, he, he himself could not do microscopy work because of bad uh, visual problems, but was enamored of collecting case reports and figuring out the clinical presentations of diseases in order to classify them. And he was enamored as well of clinical pathologic correlation. And this was a very German school of psychiatry, that is to say the use of this method of clinical pathologic correlation was unique amongst all psychiatry uh, to the Germans. And that will, of course, become a very important point. All right, so those are our actors. There's one more. It's this gentleman, and this is Oscar Fischer. Oscar Fischer uh, was Austrian, um, and uh, uh, he also did the, was a psychiatrist and, and neuropathologist in that German school of psychiatry. And he also uh, did autopsy studies uh, like um, uh, uh, Alois Alzheimer's and Nissel and others. Uh, his work arguably was the best of the group. Um, he did detailed studies of, of what we now know are amyloid plaques, but at the time that wasn't known. Um, but his work was so respected for his ability to classify and describe these plaques, and you can see some of his photo, uh, mi micrographs there, that actually the plaques were called Fisher plaques. They began to be called Fisher plaques, named in honor of Oscar Fisher. And so this takes me to this uh, case report here by Lois Alzheimer's. The 1906 case report is all very interesting and sort of was a sort of, eh, okay. This case report five years later is where things get very interesting. And I remember reading this translation of this other um, uh, uh, presentation of a somewhat younger individual who's presenting like they have senility. And I'll read you these lines from Elias Alzheimer's discussion of this case report. Mind you, five, six years at least have gone on with other cases of Auguste Dieter's, other cases like the Johann F presented here. Oscar Fisher and others have done their work and they're beginning to arrive at a conclusion. It cannot be doubted that the plaques in these specific cases do in all respects correspond to those we find in dementia senilis. The plaques seen in these young folks look a lot like what we're seeing in the senile. The question therefore arises as to whether the cases of disease which I, Alois Alzheimer's, consider peculiar are sufficiently different clinically or histologically to be distinguished from the senile dementia or whether they should be considered under that rubric. That is a revolutionary statement. He's saying what Katzman would say in 1976, that the senile and the pre-senile, there seems to be actually something common going on here. And this distinction of the one caused by extreme aging and the other rare and caused by some sort of disease, these Fisher plaques, Maybe that doesn't hold up. And in fact, in this case report, Alois Alzheimer's would essentially call for the Alzheimer's disease microscopy initiative or ADNI, I like to say. Namely, he said, we need to get many more people with dementia, follow them to death, get their brains and study them because I think we're onto something here. When I read this case report and the related work, I think, my gosh, these gentlemen, and they were all men, were speaking in very modern ways. And yet, when I went to med school in the 90s at Northwestern, I was taught they're separate. The work of Katzman hadn't yet spread. As you know, this gets at the crisis issues. So what happened? What happened? And what happened is um, uh, what I'm going to talk about now. Last bit here. Kreplin would champion this idea of Alzheimer's disease. And in his very influential textbook, you can see here, he would name Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and he would put Alzheimer's disease in the category of the senile dementias, not the pre-senile. So again, everything was starting to happen to, for the scientific community, at least in Germany, to think in a very modern way. And remind you, remind, let me remind you, this is 1910, 1915, 1914. That's where things get funky. This is Wilfred Owen. He's an officer in the British army. Uh, he's a poet as well. And this is a line from one of his poems called mental cases. These are men whose minds the dead have ravished, memory 
fingers in their hair of murders, multitudinous murders they once witnessed. Wilfred Owen was a witness to the spectacular horrors and destruction occasioned by the First World War. And he would himself suffer the psychological traumas of what we would now call post-traumatic post -traumatic stress disorder. In fact, he was one among hundreds of thousands of otherwise healthy young men who would present to hospital with notable neurological psychiatric symptoms uh, in need of treatment. Uh, this will be relevant in a moment, but the point I'm getting at now is World War I would shut down much of the research that Elias Alzheimer's, uh, Oscar Fisher, and others were doing. The country was mobilized to go to war, not to do research. In the years that would follow, of course, Germany would lose this war and plunge them into, into, national, into uh, social and economic chaos. And indeed, that would be what would uh, 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 shut down much of the research that Elias Alzheimer's and his colleagues were doing. Some of them were, of course, killed in the war. Elias Alzheimer's himself died of kidney failure in 1915. But the point I'm getting at is that the resources that they needed to carry on their research were largely uh, gone by the 1920s. The uh, expenses to support um, uh, asylums as places of care were largely vanishing the infrastructure for research essentially fell apart courtesy of the First World War and the economic devastation. But that's not all. Back to that case report I mentioned. Um, the Tubinger Chronic uh, was a newspaper of the area and in its column from, from city to country reported on Elias Alzheimer's case report, reported on the meeting on that Saturday afternoon meeting of the psychiatrists. And they commented at the end of his case report, there were no questions. Everyone just went on to the next case. And the next case was this, on the analysis of psychotraumatic symptoms. And in the audience was this young psychiatrist, Carl Jung. And this case generated vigorous discussion, the Tumaker Chronic would, would report, uh, not the Lois Alzheimer's biological case. And the case was a case of what we would now call a psychodynamic uh, theory of, of illness. A at the time, before the First World War, psychodynamic models of mental illness, of, of neurological illnesses, were sort of a fringe area of work being advanced by both Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud, who at the time were close collaborators. Later, they would have a radical rift in their relationship and, and, and become um, separated. But it was World War I that would transform psychodynamic theories of mental illness and neurological illness from a fringe to the norm, and they would become very prominent and influential. Another event would occur. This is Oscar Fisher again and, and Kreplin. And this is an essay by Emil Kreplin, Psychiatric Observations on Contemporary Issues. Remember, Germany was in devastation by many people's eyes and suffering uh, social and economic and political upheaval. And Emil Kreplin in the 1920s offered his analysis of why. He wrote here, the frequency of psychopathic predisposition in Jews could have played a role, although it is their harping criticism, their rhetorical and theatrical abilities and their drogedness and determination, which are most important. He would go talk uh, about how the war had um, thinned Germany of its uh, 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 self-sacrificing and able men and instead left suffering sickly and decrepit, uh, dominating the um, uh, uh, country. Uh, Emil Kreplin as you could see, uh, developed anti-Semitic and eugenic views. Indeed, he would essentially wreck his reputation such that his influence, his, his textbook would fade from influence. He would die in the 1920s and one of his collaborators would go on to become a prominent Nazi psychiatrist who would advance uh, eugenic theories. So my point is, is that by about 1940, the infrastructure that sustained this German science, and they were all very German, both in ethnicity and in language, had essentially destroyed what they had done. The war, the economic and social chaos, the anti-Semitism, the nationalism would, would essentially wreck this work and it would disappear, leaving the battlefield, if you will, to a victorious America. And it's in victorious America where we see people like this gentleman, Dr. Will Menninger, champion a model of psychiatric illness that had very little interest in dementia. This is Dr. Will on the cover of Time magazine in 1948, making the cover of Time back then was making it, <laughs> okay? It was like having 20 million Twitter followers, whatever. Um, and what the story, what cover story was about was um, how Dr. Will, the rangy, lanky Kansas psychiatrist 
who was the head of the American Psychiatric Association, was advancing um, a psychodynamic theory of illness and traveling around America speaking about this. Psychiatry in America would take off as a field, um, and it was Freudian. It was about a psychodynamic theory of illness. It's ironic because, of course, Freud hated America. He was very disdainful of Americans. But America would champion a psychodynamic theory of, of mental illness, therefore would have very little interest in dementia because, of course, persons with dementia were viewed as not capable of participating in psychotherapy uh, and, uh, 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 and therefore not amenable to um, uh, the treatment. Moreover, it was therefore felt that it was simply aging that was causing uh, dementia and therefore something not amenable to the psychodynamic model of treatment. Neurology, meanwhile, smaller field, was enamored of lesion-based approaches to, psych to neurology and a disease like dementia viewed as a diffuse problem would certainly also be dismissed as a very little interest. And so essentially the dark ages descended and for uh, the next 50 years or so from about 1910 or so, uh, 60 years to 1970s, dementia, Alzheimer's was essentially viewed as a non-medical problem. And so as I say, this gentleman came along and uh, uh, argued using science that we need to see senility as uh, caused by a disease, caused by Alzheimer's disease. And he would cite electron microscopic examinations of the brains of the quote senile to make the argument that they didn't have extreme aging, they had a disease and that disease was Alzheimer's disease. And making the claim that something is a disease and not caused by say aging is an important claim, especially in a modern country, developed country, because you're saying that the full force and thrust of medicine now needs to be brought to bear to solve this problem. Doctors need to diagnose it. They need to research it and study it. Care must be delivered to these individuals. It takes a private family problem and makes it a public medical problem, if you will. And I've talked a bit about uh, 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 his work and, and how things got going in the 80s. In addition, um, the desperate families furious at the poor quality of care, the lack of any attention to their relative with dementia would come together. And, and this is uh, uh, one of those family members, Jerry Stone, and form the organization that would come to be called the Alzheimer's Association. Jerry Stone was a Chicagoan, um, was the CEO of the Fortune 500 company, the Stone Container Corporation. Sadly, his wife, Evie, developed dementia, ultimately would die of it. And he, in his uh, take charge CEO type way said, you know, I'm not putting up with this disorganized, can't get straight answers, no one has any uh, 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 help to offer my wife. And he would join together with several other desperate families to form the organization that would come to be known as the Alzheimer's Association. A particular note was this woman, Hilda Prigian, um, who lived into her 90s. She also, like Jerry Stone, um, uh, had a husband, uh, a spouse who had all dementia. And she also witnessed how poor the system was for diagnosis and treatment. In fact, she would form in Minnesota the organization that would be the model for the Alzheimer's Association. Jerry Stone knew talent and he saw talent in her, called her up and, and met with her. And along with uh, five other families, they gathered together to form the association. In the book, uh, I talk about some of the contentious decisions that they had to make and some of the uh, infighting that went on uh, to create the organization we now know as the Alzheimer's Association. But what I wanna focus on here is the point that this was families, a self-help group coming together because medicine simply wasn't paying any attention. And the other events that were occurring to cause recognition of the disease, I depict here in this graph. So this is time and years, 1800, 1820, et cetera. It's a chronological time on the x-axis. And this is a frequency count on the y-axis. And using Google Ngram, what I've done is just simply do a simple plot over about 200 years of time of the occurrence of two words in the English language lexicon, autonomy and beneficence. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is how something happens around 1900. Around 1900, you start to see um, the gradual decline of the word beneficence in our language and the gradual uptake of the term autonomy. Um, uh, in an almost sort of exponential way over the course of the 20th century. And what I'd like to, the point I'm making with this slide is something happened by the end of the 20th century uh, uh, in America and in other countries. Namely, not only did science say that there's something going on in the brains of the senile that looks a lot like a disease, but culture said 
there's something going wrong in older adults who can't self-determine their lives anymore, which ought to not be thought of as normal, but as abnormal. And I would argue that it's this rise of this idea of autonomy, of self-determination, self-creation, that would be responsible for creating the cultural milieu within which we could come to see aging related cognitive changes, not as normal, but as abnormal because it's keeping someone from being a person. And I would argue that this wasn't only really culturally fully possible when by the 1970s, it became unacceptable to say that there are certain kinds of people that won't have their autonomy fully respected because it was right around the same time that Kathman published his essay in the Annals of Neurology that the first woman was admitted to West Point. Prior to that, a woman could not go to war, could not go to West Point. Um, and other transformations were occurring for people of color, LGBTQ, and other groups to recognize that we all as adults should have our ability to self-determine our lives respected. And it's within that kind of cultural context that you create the milieu which says getting old and forgetful and unable to self-determine your life is not normal and should be something that we should do something about, bring in the uh, amyloid plaques, and you now have a medical approach to, to solve that problem of the loss of self-determination and aging. The other event, which I gestured to when I talked about Lewis Thomas's book, uh, uh, essay, The Problem of Dementia, is the rise of the recognition of this person that we call the caregiver. This again is another one of those engram plots. And what I'd like to draw your attention to are two things. Number one, the paucity of any mentions in the, in the English language literature of the word Alzheimer's disease. And then the takeoff around 1976, Katzman's essay and other events. But right lagging that is another curve symmetric to or parallel to the Alzheimer's curve. And that's a plot of the word caregiver. For as ubiquitous as this word is, caregiver in our lexicon, it's actually an incredibly modern word. And this is a very important point to reflect on. There, as long as humans have been taking care of each other, there have been caregivers. In the book of Ruth, in the Old Testament, uh, Ruth is uh, a daughter-in-law to Naomi, her mother-in-law. And widowed Naomi is uh, old and frail, and Ruth takes care of her. And that's what the book of Ruth is about. The book of Ruth is, the book, is a story of a daughter-in-law caring for her mother-in-law and making all the sacrifices that, that a caregiver makes. It's a fascinating story to read because it's quite contemporary uh, for what she does in terms of the poverty she faces and the struggles that she lives through to care for her mother-in-law, Ruth. But the book of Ruth does not refer to Ruth as her mother-in-law's caregiver. She's just a good, dutiful daughter-in-law. This idea of caregiver is incredibly contemporary and you can trace it right back to work in social sciences and economics, which began to think differently about household labor and the roles of uh, families as, as producers. And the role of the caregiver began to be recognized as a distinct and separate role from other family type roles, the role of a spouse, the role of an uh, of a, of a adult child. This is incredibly important in order to quantify the burden of, of, of disability, and particularly disabilities caused by dementia. You saw in Lewis Thomas's uh, uh, essay, his mention of the burden on families. And indeed, over the course of the Alzheimer's story, you will see that a frequent way to frame the problem of Alzheimer's is to frame it as the burdens upon caregivers, their time, their task, and the cost of that time and task to their lives. A very contemporary idea. So um, this is a, a, a Associated Press uh, um, article about uh, Hilda Prigian. Uh, I, I can't read you the text, but just wanted to sort of show you some of the archival work I did. And, and she's the Alzheimer's widow reaching out to others. And much of Hilda Prigian's advocacy um, as, as a board of directors member of the Alzheimer's Association was to advance one of the association's goals, which was the creation of a national long-term care social insurance program. The association, the association wanted to raise awareness, deliver care, promote research towards a cure, and create a national long-term care social insurance program to assure that caregivers and patients who were disabled had support. And Prigian would advocate for this. Um, but then things got problematic. And now let me talk about some of the problems that unfolded in the 80s. So, so far, everything I've told you about was how science and culture turned a rare disease into a common disease, right? But that wasn't the title of my book. It's how the culture then turned it into, excuse me, power 
politics turned into a uh, crisis. So let's talk about the crisis. So this is an April 1990s uh, uh, issue of National, the National Journal, which in, in DC was like sort of the, the thing everyone read. It was like the hill, if you will. Um, and in the April issue of the National Journal, the cover story was about Alzheimer's disease. And there were uh, pages of stories about Alzheimer's in that issue, and I have all those. And this is one of those stories, how many victims of Alzheimer's disease. And this right next to it is a, a PSA put out by the Alzheimer's Association. This isn't their first PSA. It's probably the second or third that the association did, but this one's a, a pretty important one today. There are at least 4 million victims of Alzheimer's disease. But for most every one of those victims, there is another, a husband or wife, a son or daughter, whose entire life changes with the demands of caregiving. Walter Cronkite. This is very important, both for what it says, a lot of people with the disease, and at least the same number of people caring for those people. Again, that framing of patient and caregiver. We talked about the rise of the role of the caregiver, okay? Look at who it came from, too. America's most trusted newsman, Walter Cronkite. If Walter Cronkite says it, it's true. How many victims of Alzheimer's? The sidebar story on the other side of the page of that National Journal was this. Numbers are subject to dispute. This sidebar story reported how the studies that were being cited, the study actually, the East Boston study, that showed that there were, quote, 4 million people with Alzheimer's disease was in dispute, was in dispute by experts. And indeed, there would be this ongoing low-grade dumpster fire, if you will, of a fight about how many people have Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, it would become so annoying that the general accounting office would issue a report, Alzheimer's disease estimates of the prevalence in the United States. And here's the cover page of that report. And it would conclude that actually the East Boston study was an outlier, that there weren't 4 million people, there were probably fewer based on other prevalent studies. The point of this slide, of this discussion, is not to re-engage the scientific debates that were going on about how to measure how many people have this disease. And in the book, I talk about the, the science debates, and they're fascinating debates about what assumptions should be made and can be made. But politically, this was a disaster, because what you had is the association struggling to raise awareness and say, look at all these people. Prevalence is such an important number. But you can't get agreement about how big is the problem. And this would hamper the association's ability to earn congressional attention and support for the arguments that they were making to increase uh, uh, funding for research and uh, 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 improvements in care. But it gets worse. Because right around the same time that the self-help movement is formed, that is to say the Alzheimer's Association, right around the same time that the National Institute of Aging recently created in the 1970s makes Alzheimer's disease its focus and hires a then young neuroscientist named Zabin Kachaturian to lead its efforts. Right around those same time, this man is elected president and he would be reelected and he would serve for uh, two terms, eight years. He would usher in an approach to uh, the uh, governing of America that would be antithetical to advancing the Alzheimer's Association's goals. The following here is a quote from his 1984 State of the Union address. He's reflecting on the years prior to his election, years of rising problems, he said, failing confidence, a feeling the government had grown beyond the consent of the governed, families felt helpless in the face of mounting inflation and the indignity of taxes that reduced reward for hard work, thrift, and risk-taking. All this was overlain by an ever-growing web of rules and regulations. He would advance an approach to the governing of the United States to emphasize deregulation, devolving authority back to the states, and tax cuts. His argument was the American family was burdened by government, not by dementia. In fact, his argument was that the nine most frightening words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. A quote from his 1986 press conference. It was that sentiment about the role of government in people's lives that would be antithetical to an argument to expand the role of government in people's lives to help them, such as for the creation of a long-term care social insurance program, um, to care for people who need long-term care services, services and supports. I think that line from his press conference in light of the events of the last 12 months is rather ironic. Let's go back to, even now to Congress. April 3rd, 1990, it's Tuesday morning. There's a joint hearing of the House and Senate uh, subcommittees and committees on labor and human resources. And the hearing is dedicated to Alzheimer's disease. 
the title of the hearing is Alzheimer's, the Unmet Challenge for Research and Care. Like many of these hearings, they're, be, they're generally well attended by senators from both sides of the and congressmen from both sides of the aisle. This hearing starts out in a uh, rather dramatic way when Senator Mark Hatfield, Republican of Oregon, begins the hearing with a story of his father, a third generation in her family of blacksmithing, a powerful man reduced to practically nothing as almost a vegetable, he says. He admits that his father had Alzheimer's disease and brings the hearing to a hushed silence. It's one of the first folks to admit that that was in the family. Present at that hearing also was Hilda Prigian, and this is her quote, people are afraid, I'm afraid, they're afraid of what will happen to them if they get this disease. They're even more afraid, she said, even more afraid of how their families will cope. We cannot yet prevent the terrible emotional cost of Alzheimer's, but we can and must do something about the financial burden that's all but impoverishing the wealthiest of families. So the case was being made for long-term care social insurance. Congress was listening, and in fact, they meet this gentleman here, a congressman from Texas named Tom DeLay, who said that their issue was dear to my heart. That is to say, the issue that Hilda Pridgian and her advocates were talking about. But he cooled when talked to turn to the need for a federal long-term care program. After the volunteers left his office, DeLay explained, that's where we may break ranks. No one has yet told me how we're going to pay for this. So DeLay is important, not because he was a congressman from Texas, but he would go on to become majority whip when this gentleman, Newt Gingrich, was elected to be the Speaker of the House and would adopt a, an approach to uh, governing uh, uh, in, uh, that would oppose the expansion of the federal government, that would oppose the raising of new taxes. All of this led to um, uh, uh, the association taking stock that the times had changed. And this is a, I was able to go through the archives of the Alzheimer's Association's Board of Directors and found this memo from a January 1995 meeting written by Steve McConnell, who was the Vice President for Public Policy. Steve assessed the situation in the 1990s. Uh, there is also a changing philosophy that stresses a balanced budget, smaller government, lower taxes, less entitlement spending, a shift from federal to state government, an emphasis on personal responsibility. This, he concluded, poses new challenges and opportunities for the association to educate new elected officials about Alzheimer's disease and the association's central issues, research, and long-term care and to develop strategies to advance those issues in a new environment. He was being generous there. Uh, developing strategies to advance uh, uh, long-term care simply was not going to be successful. And just to add to it, the culture wars were, of course, brewing. This is uh, Phyllis Schlafly, who campaigned vigorously against the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, one of her major concerns was that it would mean women would be drafted into the military and set to serve in war. I could go on, but what you have are a bundling of a host of social and cultural issues along partisan lines. Oppose long-term care social insurance, oppose ERA, oppose abortion. It's a list that would add up such that if you are in favor of any one of those things, um, uh, uh, you have to be in favor of all of them and vice versa. Uh, and so too on the, uh, on the left. And so it's this polarization that would mark by the end of the 20th century that would further thwart advancing a common solidarity of the nation around what to do about the millions of people with disabling cognitive impairments, their family members. I'll just add to another reason why the Alzheimer's disease became a crisis in addition to these social and political events is stigma. And this is a quote from Walter Annenberg, who was ambassador to the United Kingdom under Ronald Reagan, who was quoted in the New York Times as to why he didn't visit with his friend who now had Alzheimer's disease. You have a living person who ostensibly is all right and he's just out of it. I don't want to see him in this light anymore, the ambassador said. I prefer to remember him as a vigorous fellow. And so he stayed away from his friend Ronald Reagan and presumably stayed away from his wife, Nancy, further contributing to the stigmas of Alzheimer's. Below is the Lou Ruvo Institute, designed by uh, Lou Ruvo, uh, uh, Larry Ruvo, in honor of his father, Lou, who died of Alzheimer's. Uh, Lou was, uh, excuse me, Larry was so bothered by the um, uh, 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 embarrassment of his father's illness that he would construct the institute to have no common waiting room, but instead private waiting rooms so that no one person saw another patient. Frank Geary designed it, hence the funky design. All right, so how are we going to get out of the crisis? Well, uh, I think in a talk that's uh, to a fellow Alzheimer's Center, um, uh, this graph uh, is like the um, American flag or any other uh, 
any other number of the iconic uh, images. This is the Jack curves. So biomarker-based redefinition of the disease, and I talk about that history of the creation of PIB and other biomarkers. It's a fascinating story. And of course, the idea here is that um, using uh, biomarker-based assessments, looking for amyloid, and now we can see tau, we can visualize the disease, develop drugs that target those pathologies, and uh, treat the disease. And this is the cover story of Nature from the early phase one study of Atacanumab that Eric Ryman and an accompanying editorial would cause, would describe as a breakthrough. And if the results were of the dramatic changes in amyloid were confirmed in a subsequent phase three study, that this would be game changing. We all know now that they were confirmed in a phase three study, but the benefits are far less uh, uh, dramatic than perhaps we would desire. Um, the data themselves were also somewhat controversial. The FDA is due to make a, a headline-making decision in June. But the point is, I think that many of us, I think, concur. We're certainly counting on better drugs to go after the pathology, but we're not going to drug our way out of this disease. Which leads me to the O2 Center in London, when we all met the Alzheimer's Association's International Congress in London, when yet more negative trials were released. <laughs> Um, we're all realizing this is a very heterogeneous disease, far more complicated than we perhaps we have portrayed it. And yet, the Lancet issues a report that 30 some odd percent of the risk of developing dementia, dementia, not Alzheimer's, but dementia, can be reduced by interventions. I want to talk just briefly about some of that story. This is Lisa Barnes. Many of you know her. She's a, a brilliant psychologist and epidemiologist at Russian University who's studied the social determinants of brain health. I bring her up because her, I, I profile her in the book because she has a very interesting story. She started out interested in the brain as the brain as the brain. She even did work on HM, the famous lesion-based case of the individual who had both of his hippocampi lesion to prevent developing further seizures. He, of course, would develop profound amnesia. But Lisa would have some experiences in her life that would change her focus on the brain as the brain as the brain and recognize how the world around our brain affects itself. She grew up in Chicago, where you all are right now, and many of you are, in the south side, and lived in that wonderfully integrated, progressive neighborhood of Hyde Park. She went to school at Wellesley, though, for college, and would travel to Boston sometimes to go enjoy the city. But in Boston, she witnessed what racism can be like. In fact, it was so disturbing to her, she would go transfer down to the south to attend a historically black college and complete her education. So we, Lisa witnessed the effects of racism on her. And that helped broaden her perspective on how the brain is not just the brain, but affected by the world around it. Framingham, a little bit further west of Wellesley, is the famous city where we learn so much about heart disease. Framingham is also that city which has taught us how the risk of developing dementia has been steadily declining since the 1970s. And when the Framingham investigators look at why that's happened, it's all about access and opportunity. The opportunities of at least a 12 years of education and the access that falls from that for having access to good health care, particularly cardiovascular health care. And so the story I'm trying to tell here is that we, while we may not have cures for Alzheimer's, while aducanumab may at best be a modestly disease modifying drug, if it even does work, we do have ways right now that we can uh, take steps we can take to reduce the harms to our brain health. And I chronicle how Lisa and others work show us the way. There are other ways that we can learn to live with this crisis. This is a variety of different robots that have been developed as assistive devices for persons living with dementia. There's power of the robot seal, which uh, kind of interacts with you in a sort of a weird way, but it's got a little robot bit in it. There's Pepper, the uh, robot that has uh, artificial intelligence that can learn about you and interact with you. There's a lot of promise for technology to uh, solve the Alzheimer's crisis. But I do, and I point out in the book, want to warn us that artificial intelligence is just that, it's artificial, it's not human intelligence, it's not fully capable of the moral experience and moral agency that a caregiver needs to exercise to care for someone with disabling cognitive impairments. Robots will help, but they can't substitute for humans for this humanitarian problem. There are other uh, things we'll need to attend to to solve the crisis. This is my patient, Arthur Packle, who presented to me seemingly normal, but clearly had something going on. He had lost most of his and his wife Renee's wealth from a bad business decision. And this is a recent study that came out in JAMA Internal Medicine just a few months ago, showing that on that left side of that incident point at time zero, 
that bad credit transactions and credit reports are occurring in individuals who are then diagnosed years later with Alzheimer's disease and related disorders, showing us how the banking and financial services industries are probably having their hands on some of the best biomarkers for cognitive decline uh, uh, out there. And so we need to think about how to rejigger society to uh, help us detect people who are having cognitive problems. You know, we want to transform the disease into a biomarker-based diagnosis. This is a bus kiosk on 12th and Market Street in Philadelphia. Know your risk, know your A1C. Diabetes is all about that one number, the A1C. Maybe Alzheimer's will be all about your PTAU and other related biomarker measures. Um, but we're going to face some challenges when we, with this disease distinct from the physical diseases. And let me wrap up with the story of Marco Bentley, a nurse who lived in Canada, who wrote a living will. You can see the text here. The bottom line of her living will was, if I develop an incurable illness, no longer recognize my family, I desire that I be euthanized and certainly not be fed if I can't feed myself. So her advanced directive if she should get dementia. Sadly, see years later, this is Marco Bentley with dementia. Uh, her daughters want her feeding stopped in the long-term care facility in Canada. The facility declines to do that. I chronicle this case in my book. It made the headlines. Um, it's a story of the very difficult moral decision that we're going to face um, when we stop treatments like aducanumab because, quote, things have gotten too bad. What kind of palliative care will we offer people and how will we decide when and how we're going to die of this disease? And I take those issues on in the end of the book. But I think that the thing we have to confront still is the ways we talk about the disease will will shape the ways we think and feel about the disease. This is not an ad for the Phantom of the Opera. This is an ad for Biogen's anti-amyloid approach to Alzheimer's disease. Even though he has just started to forget where he's traveled, amyloid beta has been accumulating long before symptoms appear. Biogen, visit us at biogen.com. So they're raising awareness here in hopes, obviously, that you know their anti-amyloid approach gets marketed. So at some point, if it does, um, you can imagine whatever name they'll name out of Canamab being put on this ad. I would argue that this kind of imagery, this kind of Phantom of the Opera image, is not the kind of image that's going to help us address the stigmas and dread and uh, other uh, negative uh, 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 cultural tropes that are surrounding this disease. And I don't think that this kind of imagery helps us. All right. I've explained to you how a rare disease became common and how that common disease became a crisis. I think that you can take away from this a message that much of it is in our hands. Much of it is things that we can do in terms of the ways we structure society, organize society, talk about the disease, interact with people with disabled with dementia, and as a society provide care for them. I thank you so much. Uh, if you get a chance to read the book, I'd love to hear what you think. It's available on e and uh, print as well as uh, 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 a audio book. I narrate, I read the first and last chapters and whatnot. There's a wonderful actor who reads the in between, and uh, if you get a chance to, to let others know about it, please do. And there's a bit of time for questions, and I'm also available on email and whatnot afterwards. And I hope to see some of you once again live at the various meetings. So I'll stop there and open it for some questions. Thank you so much, Jason, for your um, phenomenal um, lecture today and uh, for writing this book, uh, a very important book. That and provocative. And I wish we could take you out for lunch because I think there's just so much that we could dig into um, on all these different areas that you've raised. So I, um, I will probably be one to be emailing you with some different ideas and questions and thoughts. I wanna open it up just now to, we have a few minutes left for questions from uh, the audience. From Please. Those who have attended. Bob. Great, Jason. That was just really a wonderful talk. Um, the you, going through the history of Alzheimer's disease uh, and dementia is is just a remarkable story. I'm glad you put it down into print and shared with it, shared it with us today. Um, I found it so ironic that Ronald Reagan um, ended up dying of Alzheimer's disease, and yet his policies were antithetical to um, 
to, to caring for the disease and getting uh, research done on the disease. Also, Newt Gingrich um, uh, had a similar philosophy, but he's, uh, I, I, I think, more recently been uh, advocating for Alzheimer's uh, research. That's right. Yeah, could you could you elaborate a little bit on his role? Uh, these yeah, days? I have a whole chapter in the book called "Hope and a Plan," and um, I was able to really get deep into the issues of the early aughts. And you're right, Newt Gingrich is a character you'll read about. Newt, um, he was one of the members of the Alzheimer's study group, and he actually took on Alzheimer's as one of his topics. In fact, when he in his failed run for presidency, uh, he tried to reboot his campaign to be about Alzheimer's disease. Didn't catch hold. Uh, all the efforts to make Alzheimer's sort of like a national movement issue uh, have kind of flopped. And I recount in Hope and a Plan how the association made a very uh, brilliant tactical decision to go quiet in an effort to advance their goals and succeeded uh, remarkably uh, in that. But back to Gingrich, um, it's interesting. Uh, you know, Gingrich, after he left Congress, would actually advance a vision for uh, uh, social insurance for health care that um, was Obamacare. But then the politics around Obamacare had Gingrich flip uh, against the individual mandate. Um, and uh, uh, I can't say where he stands on matters of long-term care social insurance, but my hunch is, is he probably is of the camp that there's no new taxes. And you know, you're not gonna have a long-term care social insurance program if you don't have a payroll tax. That's what Germany does, for example. So you, you, we will have to raise taxes or impose a tax to have long-term care social insurance. Um, so yes, you're right. Hope and a plan. Take a look at the chapter. Newt's in there. So is George Vredenberg, Harry Johns, uh, Robert Eggie. It's a fascinating tale of some really elegant politics. Um, I I just have a comment. Hey, Sandy. Um, hi, Jason, which I couldn't resist. Thank sure. you so much. This was wonderful. And um, Jason and I have had the opportunity to work together on a lot of committees and yeah. Uh, I cannot wait to get my hands on this book. So thank you. And sorry, you're not here. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, Reagan does haunt the book as well, uh, Robert. And, uh, you know, he actually fell and broke his hip uh, when he had Alzheimer's. And I have a whole chapter on hip fracture care um, uh, and efforts to, to improve the quality of hip fracture care. And I'll, I, I, I don't know if there are other geriatricians in the room, but I actually have a chapter on the history of delirium and the history of hip fracture care. And I, I remember my editor said, well, those aren't Alzheimer's. Why, why don't we cut those? And I'm like, no, we're not cutting them. <laughs> because, you know, if you had to think of what are the complications of Alzheimer's that, um, you know, I like to say that delirium is to Alzheimer's as pain is to cancer. And um, I really wanted to tell the story of uh, actually profile um, uh, 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 the researchers who developed um, uh, Sharon Inouye, who developed her whole program for being able to better identify and reduce the risk of developing delirium. And it was a fascinating story of kind of like, nevertheless, she persisted despite <laughs> everyone saying, why are you doing this? And then the hip fracture care stuff is a fascinating story of these guys at this community hospital that's about ready to go bankrupt. And they're like, well, we can do anything we want. It's, hey, go ahead. And they create this hip fracture program that, you know, is a model going uh, for, for how to do surgical care for frail older adults. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they're great tales of just people who, despite all the odds, are like, I'm not going to stop until I can succeed. And I, I think people like Sandy and others in Darby, you know, we were, I'll be with you, we were around at the beginning of all this. And it's so fascinating to see how people are finally recognizing something we've been talking about for 30, 40 years. <laughs> No, and Jason, I just want to say that I kind of came of age too in my work um, in the mid 80s when all of yeah. this was starting and the Alzheimer's Association was forming. And we were, I mean, I, I was working actually at Rush in the acute care setting at, right out of graduate school and uh, people would come in not with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but with organic brain syndrome. Yeah. That was very common in the mid 80s to be diagnosed. And what was also quite common and quite disturbing as I think about it, and I was disturbed at that time, was that people would be admitted from nursing homes for um, feeding tube placements, one after the other after the other. And it's uh, we have come a long way um, in that area as well. So and uh, lots of 
gratitude to people like you who have um, talked about, uh, you know, end of life care, palliative care, and what that um, humanely looks like. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Darby. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I okay. We have another question here, Nancy. Oh, hi. Yes, um, I'm a. I guess I represent the caregivers, and I'm also in the study programs at at um, Northwestern. And so I took care of my mom for 13 years. And I think that all started in about um, 99, 1999. Anyway, um, I am so glad to hear about this book. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen bits and pieces of the history of Alzheimer's disease, but this really looks like something that's putting it all together and also, um, you know, making it sounds like it's going to be very readable. Um, I am a speech pathologist, but retired. But um, a lot of it is too medical. And I just think this is going to be a really great book for me to um, understand. And now I realize I have a brother in law with an early onset um, Alzheimer's wife and a sister in law. Um, with a husband who I, I had been taught that any uh, Alzheimer's in the, in the age, the 50s was called early onset. And now they have prefrontal um, aphasia and the terminologies have really changed over the years since <laughs> I was dealing with it. And my mom passed away in, in um, 2015, so. Anyway, thank you for doing this. I'm You're welcome. And my laugh around terminology was just that. And Sandy, I think I saw her uh, um, as well. Sandy and I, Dr. Weintraub and I are working on a group that's trying to sort of at least organize some coherence to talking about the nomenclatures here. Um, uh, so yeah, I, uh, I appreciate your, uh, your comments uh, in anticipatory praise. Uh, and I will say that um, uh, I mentioned Hilda Pridgian earlier. And if there's one sort of person I discovered in doing this book who deserves to be honored and recognized, like one of those forgotten lives that have uh, been finally recognized in obituaries, it's Hilda Pridgian. Um, and I, I'm determined to, to sort of raise sort of her story and get it out there. She was a phenomenal person and arguably really was the creator of the Alzheimer's Association with Jerry Stone and deserves to be recognized for that role. I had the privilege of interviewing her son, Brian, um, and let's just say that when Ryan wrapped up talking about his mother, he started weeping. Um, and I, and I can understand why she was a magnificent person who, who struggled, uh, against a system that was indifferent and to this day is a bit indifferent still too. So anyway. Yeah. yeah I'm also very involved with final options and compassionate choices. And I have personal friends who, um, have had experience or used final options. And, you know, we still have, I would, I have written something on my will similar um, to what you read, but again, that is not accepted in the, in the laws that are being uh, passed right now. I think we're up to 13 states in Illinois, of course, is um, uh, there's a bill um, in Illinois right now to um, have the final options available, but um, it, it's a very concern for me um, because I would like it to also cover somebody who has um, Alzheimer's. I think you'll find that last chapter of the book, The Worlds We End, very uh, provocative. Um, it's about death, and uh, I go straight to some of the most difficult issues. Thank you so much, Nancy, for sharing that and being here today. And again, thank you, Jason, for You're your welcome. We I really still wish I could be there live, but uh, we'll we'll do it sometime. We'll so see, you see you at a there. future meeting, hopefully soon. Yeah. Okay. Take thank care. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>